Briella is next. Briella, okay. I'd like to begin by welcoming those members of the public and press who are watching this live stream of this meeting via the Combined Authorities website. Due to government guidance of social distancing, this meeting is being held remotely in accordance with the meeting regulations of 2020. The software allows you to choose a name when you join the meeting to members of the public if you do not want to be identified. Please choose a pseudonym. A decision summary of the minutes uh, will be produced as usual. Uh, and the recording of the meeting will be available to view on the meeting page of the Combined Authorities website. This introduction gets longer, I think. To, to enable the meeting to run in an orderly matter, manner, I would ask all members of the committee to keep their video cameras switched on for the duration of the meeting and keep their microphones muted except when I invite you to speak. Officers will join us to introduce their reports in the usual way. Any members wishing to ask a question or make a comment should indicate by clicking their raised hand function on the right hand side of their screen. When I invite you to speak, please unmute your microphone and ask your question and then mute it again to allow the officers to respond. There's always a risk that we might run into technical problems and I would ask for your patience if we do. I would remind members and officers that all virtual meetings will be recorded. Uh, so I'll now hand over to uh, uh, governance who will do a roll call for us, please. Can't, can't hear you, Tamer. I'm here. Present. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, present. Okay, so Councillor David Ambrose Smith. Present. <laughs> Chair, I'll um, do the, the roll call because I think we have some technical difficulties. Councillor um, Liz Every. Present. Can, Councillor John. Um, Councillor Chris Seaton should be on his way into the meeting. Um, I, I can't see him at the moment. Which a long walk from Trenlin. Um, I can't. I can't hear. I can't no. hear Tamar. I'm afraid. Tamar, I think we're going to get. Uh, uh, I'll I'll run through it again. You can all hear me, can you? Yeah. You yes. Got, my, I'm really sorry. My connection's not very good at the moment. Yeah, right, so we've got uh, uh, Councillor Dave Ambrose-Smith. Present. Uh, Councillor Mike Davey. Present. Councillor Liz Every. Present. Councillor John Nish. Present. Uh, uh, Councillor Chris Seaton. Councillor Elaine Wilson. Present. And myself, John Holditch. Okay. Are you back with us, Tamer? I think yes, the next you. bit's yours as well. Uh, so, do we have any apologies? No apologies. Uh, okay. Does anybody wish to declare a disclosable pecuniary interest or a statutory disclosable interest? Please click the raised hand function on the right hand side of your screen if you wish to declare any such interest. No, that's good. Thank you very much. Uh, we've been asked to approve the minutes of the 11th of January as a correct record. Can I ask any member who does not agree with the proposal to click the raised hand function on the right hand side of your screen and now please. Hey, okay, I don't see anybody. Just one second, I've got somebody knocking on my window. Keep that, remind me in the garage. Miss Heaton has arrived. I was in the garage. <laughs> Barbara? Sorry about that. It's pouring with rain, and it would be very, 
very insistent. Okay. Uh, right, we've done the minutes. Uh, I see no objections. Are you happy that we've approved those, Tamer? Okay, yeah. Have, have, I, have I lost anybody? You're very quiet. Still here. All right. I'm going on to item 1.3 now, is that correct? Yes, sir. I, th I think we've lost governance. Chair, ha happy for you to continue. Item 1.3, Chair. Thank you. OK. Do members have any comments on the action log, please? No, don't seem to, seem to be any. So we we'll go to four. Uh, we have received questions from the Overeem Scrutiny Committee on three items of the agenda, a copy of which has been circulated electronically to all members of the committee in advance of the meeting. The question and responses will be taken at the appropriate agenda item. So, Skills Committee agenda. Do we, does the committee have any comments on the agenda plan? Don't see anybody. 1.6 then. Combined authorities forward plan. Any questions on that? No. Uh, I think I'm going to 2.1 now, Rochelle, and I'm not. Yeah, okay, thank you. We have th received three questions. Got somebody out there. Oh, okay. okay, sorry. Sorry about that, folks. Well, we have received three questions of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee in relation to this report. I will ask Democratic Services Officers to read the questions and I will read the response. So question one, Tamar. Hello, can, hello um, Chairman, can you hear me? I'm having real difficulty with my internet connection. I can at the moment. Um, so are we, I'm really, really sorry. I've just rejoined the meeting. We're asking you to read question 1A. Okay, thank you very much. So that's um, page 19, 3.2, um, appendix 2, page 26. What other level three courses are being considered above the approved? Yeah, we've lost you, Kevin. Okay. Chair. Rachel, you better take over this bit, sure. I think. Okay, so that's... Um... Page 19, 3.2, and Appendix 2, page 26. What other level three courses are being considered above the approved list to meet local business needs? Are these different across the constituent authorities? Okay, and the response is the CPCA ran its annual AEB stakeholders uh, consultation during February, which included questions about other qualifications that could be offered through the lifetime skills guarantee. We were unindated with nearly 100 responses from uh, the consultation and are currently analysing responses, which may include and analyse the constituent authorities. We're aware that hospitality and catering of the uh, rail engineering qualifications have been flagged up uh, to the DFE by the sector. So question 1B. How does this provision link to the LERV item 23, page 118, local piloting of retraining scheme for adults? Is this different ATK fund or part of item 2.1? Once the lifetime skills guarantee level three audit offer is now additional funding, uh, is now new additional funding that has been delegated to the CPCA from April 21 to July 22, separate from the retaining re ret retraining scheme. Uh, question 1C. Appendix 2, page 30 to 31, PRC delivered 72% of the enrolment eligible. Why does, sorry, why such dominance of Peterborough Regional College across the CP? sorry, across the CA area. Okay, Peterborough College dominates level three adult delivery within the AEB, as firstly they have uh, 
prioritised level three courses in their delivery plan. And secondly, as shown in section four of the paper, table four, Peaper is one of the lowest rates of level three qualifications within the population at 49%, compared with the CPCA average of 60.1%. Therefore, there is a larger marketplace of eligible learners for them to recruit uh, to note that other colleges uh, deliver more uh, level three through an advanced learning loans, such as Cambridge Regional College. Thank you. Can I ask Parminter now to uh, introduce this report, please? Parminter. Good morning. Um, thank you, um, Chairman, and good morning, members of the Skills Committee, to this first paper from me which brings some good news for the region. So as part of the government's lifetime skills guarantee for, for adults, uh, combined authorities have been delegated new funding. And this is in addition to our annual AEB funding allocation. So we have additional funding of 1,045,844 pounds that has been allocated to us to deliver the first four level three courses from the approved Department for Education course list and delivery commences from the 1st of April 2021 until the 31st of July 2022. And as various studies have shown, level three qualifications can equate to a 20% increase in average wages and a 14% increase in employment prospects. So therefore, leveling up residents who don't have a level three is really part of the jigsaw puzzle for our economic recovery and for boosting productivity in the region. So while it's great news we're receiving this funding, this paper also details some of the current context of level three provision within the region. So as, as we heard, 60% of residents are qualified to level three, and this is ahead of the national average, which is 58%. However, this masks Peterborough at 49%, Fenland at 45% of adults who've achieved a level three qualification. And in the paper, you will have seen some very detailed analysis of our AEB provision for 2019-20, which shows that only 5% of funding and 1% of enrolments in 2019-20 were onto level three courses. And out of this, only 25 enrolments were eligible for this lifetime skills guarantee from the approved course list. Therefore, there's a significant capacity building uh, that's required amongst our family of colleges and providers, and a real need to promote the level three offer to our residents and businesses so that this policy lands successfully within our region. So this paper invites the skills committee to recommend to the Command <coughs> Authority Board, because this is a key decision, the additional ring, ring fence funding from the DfE delegated to deliver first three level three courses for adults 24 plus, and secondly, to approve our approach to commissioning of this additional funding through the commissioning principles that we've set out in the paper, and also to create a separate level three courses funding line. As it is a ring fence budget, with the monitoring and evaluating this separately, and also applying a 3.4% top slice to this funding, of which it's proposed that a proportion will be used for a marketing campaign to really promote the offer to get the maximum take up. Members are also requested to note the opportunity for additional qualifications. We heard that in one of the, the questions from the overview and scrutiny committee. Um, and we, we have, um, that's a live offer um, for us to, to propose additional courses. And we're in discussions with existing colleges and providers to really understand their capacity, their proposed offer, and to make the funding allocations subject to skills committee and combined authority board approval. And then in fi finally, as I mentioned, um, our new guiding principles for commissioning of new providers that's set out in appendix one. And just to summarize that the focus here is on local capacity building and also quality, and to utilize the combined authorities light touch commissioning process to engage new providers. Um, before we open to questions, Chairman, I'd like to bring in um, Vanessa Ainsworth, 
um, from finance um, to, to, to just highlight some of the financial um, aspects uh, to members. Okay, Vanessa? Good morning, committee members. Um, just to go over some finer detail for you with regards to the finances that are presented in section five. Um, as Parminder has already mentioned, we are receiving additional funding, which is obviously not been agreed in the MTFP that was approved by the CA board in January. So this will be um, moved onto the CA board further to your uh, approval if it's so granted. As part of that, what we have shown is in table one in section five is the current approved MTFP figures. And table two is what we are proposing that these figures now are. This takes into account the increased funding. It, in, it also takes into account the increased um, amount of the 3.4%. So really, hopefully we've addressed any potential questions in that financial section for you. As part of what we will be doing with regards to the year end um, funding, we will be rolling any potential underspends from the AEB into a ring fenced reserved fund, which will then enable all this money to be moved around reasonably flexibly. And that will be presented to the CA board, um, I think either March or the, the one after. Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> still be available for questions if necessary would you please yes I'm, I'm staying on the call yeah yeah thank you very much okay members that, can i have some hands up please All right councillor wilson thank you chair um I, i've got a couple of questions okay. um the first one is just i think a glitch in the drafting um paragraph 2.4 refers to paragraph 1.3 above. As there's no paragraph 1.3, I'm assuming that refers to paragraph 1.2. Who's that question to? Balmenda? Yes, um, apologies for that um, drafting error. You're absolutely right. It refers to paragraph 1.2. Okay, no, I assume that. It seems sensible. <laughs> um, my, my second question is, um, on paragraph 4.2 on page 20, um, it seemed that a lot of the subjects that are, um, are outlined in in this um, initiative, there are a lot of subjects that were being taught that weren't on that list. So I, I was just one trying to get some sort of feel for what these subjects were that aren't on the list, because are, are we directing the 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 available funding to the right sorts of courses. And um, my third question is, um, do we have any insight into the reasons behind the 19% withdrawal rate from um, level three courses? And my final question is, um, do we have any insight into why the level three take up is so low in Peterborough. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about whether we have any insight in what, what do people do after GCSE? Why why are, is there such poor take up of level three? And if there is, if we understand, should there be some sort of intervention much earlier to make sure that there is better take up after um, GCSE of level three qualifications if through career guidance or any other interventions. So I hope those questions are clear. I, I think there's more than two, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Baminda? I just want to thank Councillor Wilson for those very insightful questions. And just to say that I've been grappling with those questions myself to really understand, and um, which is why we've done such detailed analysis um, of the data from the previous years. We are, um, as, as was mentioned in the, the response to the overview and, and scrutiny committee about the additional courses, um, the, the DOE course list is, is, um, is being updated all the time. So um, we are um, monitoring that, but we are looking to um, evaluate what the, what, the response, what the sector is telling us in terms of the gaps, because we, we um, we weren't expecting so. To be honest with you, I was not expecting so such a, a really good response that we had to the to the evaluation last year. We had 15 responses 
this year we've got nearly 100. So it's just taken us a, a bit of time just to evaluate those. And from that, we'll be able to see what the, the gaps are um, in terms of qualifications. In addition to that, we are um, talking to our colleges and providers to understand what is the offer that they are, promote, that they are proposing from the course list. And just to add as well, is that there will be our, our if you like, our regular AEB level three offer in addition to the, to the level three courses as well. So we should have across the two funding streams, quite a rich um, um, offer um, available um, for, for residents. So at the moment, we're at the stage of, um, of gathering those insights. Um, and, and as I said, the, the, I'm, I'm grappling with those questions myself. So perhaps at, at, through written procedures, we'll be able to provide an update to members um, in terms of those. And then the final question about the withdrawal. Again, we are, we're in discussions with providers to really understand about withdrawal. Now, because this year was part of the 2019-20, was also part of the lockdown period, we understand that some of those are COVID related, but we are doing some work with our colleges and providers to really understand um, um, withdrawal across all provision, not just, not just the level three. Thank you. Did that Thank answer you. all your questions? Councillor Wilson? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Paminta. Thank you. Right, uh, next one is Councillor Davy. Thanks, Chair. Um, two, two questions, or really, I think it might be about clarification, really. The, uh, uh, the tables that uh, uh, Vanessa just spoke about, table one and table two, um, there's, I, I, I understand why 21, 22 looks differently, but does that mean in table two that there is uh, increased funding ongoing beyond 21, 22? Um, because it, I, I thought from the paper, it looked to me as though it was a one year funding. So forgive me if I've misunderstood. And the second bit I think is about just asking Parminda to clarify a bit about the commissioning process. Given the data and the information you've shared, one would assume that it's likely we'll be looking for people who are able to deliver in Fenland and um, Peterborough. And are you able to be explicit in the commissioning process about that? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I think, Vanessa, the first question was to you, I think. Correct, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, there is a slight increase across the board for the figures going forward. Um, what I've taken the opportunity to do is to uh, enter all the um, exact figures that we've been given by the DFE for the years going forward. Some of them um, going into 23, 24, 24, 25 are still estimates. However, what we've done is we've taken those as a flat line from 22, 23. Um, so there is a percentage increase just because of the um, how the AEB have worked their figures out. So whilst the additional funding is just for the one year, there is some uh, extra funding that's moving forward as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, <coughs> I think the second part of the question was yours. Yes, so, so thank you to Councillor Davy for the second question, which is about the commissioning process. Um, so as you've seen from the, the, the uh, commissioning principles, it really is about building local capacity and, and, and also um, developing quality. Um, so in, it, um, we, haven't, we haven't actively gone out to, to procure as yet because we need to go get the approvals um, from the Combined Authority Board and Skills Committee before we do that. But we certainly wanted to set out our stall, if you like, in terms of what the, the focus was going to be. In terms of the, the, the second bit of the question around local commissioning, um, absolutely. So in terms of the procurement flexibilities, they allow us to ring fence um, based on geography. And so we, we, we have not used that flexibility um, previously so I'm, I'm very keen to, to use that flexibility to, to really target um, um, our interventions and the investment um, of, of funding um, to the areas that really need it uh, with, with new provision. And um, given that we already have a wide offer uh, through, through our pre-existing providers for the rest of the region um, in any case. So, so the answer to that question is yes, it, it's something that we, we, we're, looking to, we're looking to take forward. Okay. Thank you, Parminder. Thank you, Councillor Avery. 
Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Parminda. Good to see you. And Vanessa, thank you very much for, for the, the report. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, capacity, but also um, uh, about uh, the place-based approach that um, we asked for figures on, which you gave us later on in the meeting. So that's really, really helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of um, East Cambridgeshire, uh, 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 the figures um, of providers tend to be just in Cambridge or obviously Fenland, but I do know that there are a number of providers outside the Cam Cambridgeshire that have a, a, a quite a lot of um, uh, people that are uh, uh, go there. I'm talking about uh, West Suffolk, uh, where we have a lot of uh, youngsters go out of, of East Cams. So that's the, the first thing, you know, I mean, it would be nice if they were in Cambridge, but, but beyond that, they're, they're we do know that there are learners out there. I absolutely want to support this. All the research shows that uh, youngsters drop out of a level three because they don't have enough money and they have to go to work. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important that there is progression available, even from level one to level two to level three. So absolutely, this is a, this is a fantastic win-win, I think, for, for our, young, uh, our youngsters. And I want you to do that. In terms of looking at those courses, and thank you for your response as to why you did what you did. Um, I just want to know how flexible you're going to be because from our particular area, um, uh, 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 we have many youngsters who want to go into hospitality and leisure industry. And those are really important for us. And um, uh, the, the fact that youngsters, because we have tourism quite, uh, obviously quite a lot. So we just want to make sure that there's a flexibility that as we look at the, our internal demand for our, um, our place-based, that actually we will be able to, to fulfill uh, those and the one issue the one i find really weird that's missing is marketing because to be honest that's that's our biggest draw and that's the biggest request we get from uh, employers in our area that uh, marketing is is an area which they 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 find it difficult to get the right kind of um employees with the right qualifications so just a couple of things there if that's okay for Minda, but great this is great uh, Arminda, I think most of those questions are for you, but uh, just on one, I think it doesn't matter where you're taught, your qualifications go with your address. So if you were taught uh, outside the county, it, the qualifications would still be in, in live in Cambridgeshire, as far as I understand it. Uh, so, Parminda, up, up to you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to Councillor Every for those, for those questions. So the first, first thing, the first point about um, residency. It is, from an AEB perspective, um, the CPCA AEB funding funds our residents, so it's it's irrelevant um, where they're studying. So, and West Suffolk College is is part of our um, family of providers um, um, locally, and we do commission um, West. I mean, Suffolk sorry to interrupt. Um, Councillor Every uh, is, is talking, but I don't I don't yeah. think he's yeah. Thank you. But I, mean, I just wanted to say it wasn't about residency. I've misled you on that. I know that qualifications travel with you. It's just that when you are identifying, identifying your uh, delivery groups, some of them are outside the area. And therefore, we have youngsters who are going outside there or older people going outside the area. Uh, and, and in terms of numbers, and I didn't know whether that had been taken into account. That, that was all. Not about residency. I get that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so the answer to that question is yes, they are the um, out, um, out of area providers are taken into account. And just uh, just, and just to remind members, um, in terms of some of the out of area providers who are important for us that we do commission, for instance, Stamford College, Bedford College, um, North Hertfordshire College, West Suffolk College, that they are important providers for, for our okay. residents, and we do commission them um, as part of the A AEB. And then the second question was about flexibility. Um, and just to, um, just to reiterate that, that we have this additional funding for, for the, if you like, the, the DFB approved list. That's not to say that firstly, we can't lobby for additional courses to be added to that list, but we still have our AB, if you like our main AB funding budget as well, um, through which we fund level three courses. So when you add the two budgets, the two pots together, we, we, will, we will have flexibility, um, certainly for our own evolved AEB, um, to provide additional um, level three courses that perhaps the DFB decide not to, not, not to provide on their list. So that's not to say that we can't, we can't offer it. Just to reassure members on that, we will still continue 
with the, the level three offer that we've got at the moment. We'll still continue with providers uh, and encourage them to deliver that. But, but the gap really is it, um, the courses which the DFB have identified and they have, um, they, and they have identified those as being of economic value to the country. And, 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 and I guess what the paper is trying to say is that based on that course, that, that list, um, um, we're not delivering many of those courses through AUB and therefore we need to build capacity there. But there's certainly other level three provision that we are currently funding through our AUB and that will continue. So therefore we'll have a much richer offer um, of level three courses um, for our residents as a result of this funding. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I don't have anybody else showing at the moment. So can I move to the recommendations then, please? Uh, do I have a proposer and a seconder for the recommendations, both A and B? I'll propose, Chair. Thank you. Seconder, please. Seconder, please. I'll second. Right, thank you. Okay. Uh, Michelle, do I have to go to a vote or are you happy for people show hands? Uh, that's fine. If we can do the uh, chat show of hands, please, Councillor Holder. Yeah. Would you. those that are against these proposals please show? I think they're carried, yeah? Happy? Good? Turn me pages. I'm going to 2-2 two -two now, business growth service. Uh, we have received two questions from Overview and Scrutiny Committee in relation to this report, and I will ask Democratic Services Officer to read the questions and I will read the responses. So, question 2A. The agenda item as a whole will be perceived as too opaque to residents and likely to cause suspicion as to the combined authority's commitment to transparency. For this particular business proposition, <laughs> Can the committee consider a better process for ensuring greater transparency when such significant changes to a budget is made? Okay, transparency is at the heart of the work of the combined authority with decision-making processes reflecting this ethos. The committee will continue to demonstrate a commitment to transparency by seeking to improve where possible. Whilst no change to any direction of the CPCA budget is sought, considerations as requested are vigorous and uh, progress remains a priority. Question 2B. Page 42 to 43, the OSC have concern over the technical fault that resulted in the potential loss of substantial EU funding to the BGS and over 600 potential new jobs. What processes are in place to ensure such errors don't happen in the future? What is the likelihood that the claim will be accepted despite the technical fault? A number of improvements have been put in place. In light of what has, that has happened, a procurement portal provider has updated its processes and the procedures to ensure greater clarity and support in dealing with the potential issues like this again. The CPCA has incorporated clearer instructions around dealing with technical issues in the tender document and will also now ensure there is an, uh, is an hour delay between submission and deadline to release of tenders so that the situation does not happen again. <clears throat> the MHCLG has indicated they would not contract on ERDF inward investment projects without pre-procurement. That is an option we are considering, although the CCPA would need to find new money to match. The MHCLG would be prepared to issue funding agreement prior to the new procurement process. The CPA would need to show how this additional service would complement the contractual service. So, are we uh, happy to accept that? Yes, Chair. So, if we can just introduce the report author. Okay. So, I don't have an introduction for the report, so can you take that? John T. Hill. It, it's, <clears throat> actually, it, it's Alan, uh, or I would like Alan to, uh, Alan Down to, to present for me, please. Over to you, Alan. Uh, 
Alan? Come in, Alan. Your time's not up. He's still uh, muted, John. Oh, he's, got, he's on now. Uh, uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, good morning, committee members. Sorry about that. I had a technical issue. Um, <laughs> this report is about the Business Growth Service. Uh, it is to note the report going to the Business Board, uh, including the urgency uh, dis procedure decision the mayoral decision, uh, the contracted and financial position of the business growth service, and a recommendation to the CA board about an increase in a capital grant. Uh, let me just take you through the report, please. Um, item 2.1, um, we're looking um, for an exception to increase the capital grant from 150,000 pounds to 500,000 um, pounds. Basically, at the Business Board on 10th of November, under 2.2 local growth funds, um, with the combined authority awarded 2.043 uh, million pounds of money, LGF money, into the Business Growth Service. Uh, the headlines are that um, the capital growth grants could only go up to 150,000 pounds per business application. <laughs> Um, we signed the Business Growth Service contract with Gateys on the 12th of February, and since the 15th of February, Gateys have been working with several hot business uh, inward investment inquiries for the Cambridge and Peterborough area. And one particular, is now, one particular business has now moved uh, to an advanced investment decision. The business has provided feedback that the current grant uh, doesn't necessarily meet requirements. Um, as it is set at 150,000, we would like to increase that to 500,000 um, pounds. And they are looking at two sites in the Peterborough area. One is the Morley Court ex Coca Cola site, and the other one is on the Trebor flagship park. Um, basically, uh, in the report, uh, it, the, the business investment proposal is in the confidential appendix in attachment four. Um, and if you go uh, a bit further on, the uh, manufacturing jobs would represent great value for money. Um, basically in the year one, it would represent 3.5K per job. Um, and over five years actually go down to 1,000 pound a job. Um, so we would definitely like to move towards the 500,000 pound grant being made available. So the recommendation is to request to raise the maximum grant on amount for this application and based on the merits of the application, um, etc. The second point under 2.2, um, one of the conditions of the FBC was that we had to have all the ESF and ERDF uh, investment in, uh, funding in place. Uh, we had the ESF, we had one of the ERDF which was to do with growth coaching. Unfortunately, in early February, it was becoming clear that MHCLG weren't moving on the position for ERDF inward investment. So we sought to, uh, to um, use the change control process and the urgency procedure and the mayor or decision notice uh, to move to contract uh, because we felt that this could go on for some considerable time. And as you're aware, uh, committee, uh, we were due to sign the business growth service contract back in October and we were already four months uh, you know, late as it was. Uh, this was successful. Uh, all the documentation, um, the change control process and the mayoral decision notice and the urgency procedure is uh, in, are in the appendices one, two and three. Um, the contractual and financial plan under 2.3, um, just the headlines here. Uh, it was recognised just before Christmas that there was an oversight to one of the financial tables uh, in the FBC, which was to do with the nudge grants. Um, to correct this omission uh, and to allow the cost for these grants, the available funding for the contractor uh, to deliver the wider business growth service was reduced by an equivalent 1.5 million. This was done in January. Uh, it took a considerable amount of commercial uh, negotiation we managed to bring the uh, uh, reduction in job outcomes down from 12.7% to 5.7%. And unfortunately, we still lost 365 jobs as a result. Uh, on top of that, um, and as you will see in the mayoral decision and the urgency procedure, we also had to 
withdraw the ERDF funding for the inward investment service line. So the impact of that was that we had to take 1.96 million pounds out of the service line and that reduced it to 1.72 million left in it. Um, this obviously had an overall uh, impact. Um, we've now moved the new jobs from 6326 to 5278 and 1600 apprenticeships to 1400. And in tables uh, one and two, it gives you an outline of, of, of where we have been and where we are at the moment. Um, what we will be doing though is next steps, uh, a workshop will be set up to look at lessons learned relating to the production and approval process for the full business cases and how they might be improved to, or to reduce or eradicate emissions and errors in future. Uh, and we will report back to the business board uh, in July, 2021. Thank you. That was a long report. Well done, Noah. Thank you very much. Members? Councillor Wilson? Right. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've got one question about the capital grant increase and one question about the um, ERDF funding. Um, so should I do both now? Yes, do both. Um, on the capital grant increase, I, I note that this is... Um, um, going to be a one-off. Um, I've just one wondering how confident we are, or, or Gateleys are, that this wouldn't offering this to one company doesn't miss out on another company that could offer equal opportunities in terms of jobs and and growth if they had the same level of grant. I, I was just wondering whether there could be any sort of dispute about um, competitiveness or um, equal treatment of different companies. So that's my question about the um, grant increase. On the ERDF funding, I, I note the urgency and the need to crack on with, um, with, with this service, but I'm just wondering about, we, we went through the process of a, an outline business case and the full business case, and this seems to actually somehow undermine those business cases and, sh and shouldn't there be another business case process irrespective of the fact that the, I understand the urgency to crack on with the um, the initiative. Uh, John, I think you wanted to answer that, did you? Yes. Uh, yes, please, Chair. Um, so with, with a f first question uh, on uh, the uh, the precedent being set by offering this particular inward investment, in, invest a 500k rather than the, the current ceiling of 150. The, the current ceiling of 150k was designed for quite small, like typically 10, 20, 30 employee uh, companies, indigenous to our area to grow through coaching and, and classic expansion, a piece of kit, maybe a, bit, a, a larger area uh, for their factory. And, and 150K was seen as about right uh, for that sort of investment. Um, and, 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 and the key point here is, is that it was done on a benchmark of £5,000 per, uh, per employee uh, generated. Um, this particular opportunity came to us uh, from a very, very exciting technology company that, uh, that would really add value to, to the Peterborough Advanced Manufacturing Cluster. And, and from day one, their, uh, their, uh, their forecasts of, of jobs is £3,000 per uh, a job. And uh, over a longer period, it's £1,000 a job. So I think as, as moving to a higher grant level, can be uh, can be uh, justified on the basis that the value for money here is is much better, five times better than uh, the benchmark we set ourselves. And and perhaps and, and we wanted to do it as a one off and not create uh, a, a sort of open door here. But but if if we get another exceptional company that's that's offering really quite high numbers of high value jobs, we'd probably come back to you again and say, look, the, the, this is an, an exceptional uh, an opportunity. Uh, could we go again for a 500K exception? 
So it, 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 it does create a precedent, but I think it's a precedent that is manageable. Is, is, that, is that satisfactory? Yeah, thank you. Now, the, the second point you make is reassuring that um, it doesn't exclude equ equally um, attractive companies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, 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 we'd come back if we got another as good as this. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and, and we are in competition with at least two other cities in, in England uh, for, for this, uh, this investor. Uh, on your second question, sh should we produce another FBC? Because we, frankly, we made an error in the September FBC. We, we, we quite simply omitted a 1.5 million cost in, in a cost table. Um, uh, we, we've worked it through with our, our governance colleagues uh, and, and the business board. And, and, and we think correcting uh, uh, this error it is, is obviously the right thing to do, but, but um, we could uh, republish the FBC with the error corrected, and that, that would probably be a good a good uh, thing to do. Uh, we don't. I, I would suggest we don't need to do a whole new FBC because, in fact, it, it really is one line with an error in it in, in a table. But but we we, we could it, it, we probably should uh, reproduce that as the correct version and, and circulate it. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, happy? Um, I, I was just thinking of the EU funding as well that's missing. Uh, it, it, in terms of, uh, it, 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 does it fundamentally change uh, uh, the, the decision of what would you invest in the whole, in the whole thing? Um, I, I, certainly the business board took a view that the investment of, of their 5.4 million uh, was definitely still very much warranted uh, on, on the slightly reduced number of, of, of jobs. And, and of course, you, what one must remember, we went down from 6,300 uh, by, uh, uh, by around 5%. Um, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a huge drop. Uh, and, and still, this is the flagship programme. This produces jobs at a much higher value for money than anything we've ever invested in before. So it's, uh, it, it's not quite as good as we, it, as we hoped it would be. Uh, but it's still exceptionally good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davey. I don't, forgive me, I, I don't want to kind of rerun what's just been said, but if I've got it right, John, uh, and, uh, and, it, and Alan, it looks like as a result of these unfortunate errors that, that a thousand jobs that we'd hoped were going to happen aren't. And I think some reforecasting might be helpful as per Councillor Wilson's suggestion. And linked, oddly enough, linked back to the points in 2-1, bearing in mind that, is it not wise to have proper and clear moderation and monitoring if we're planning to increase the grant from 150,000 to 500K? Um, because the one would tend to imply that we need to be stronger with the monitoring and evaluation um, I don't, I, please don't get me wrong, I don't want to say we shouldn't take risks, particularly now, but it's just about if we're taking risks, they have to be relatively safe. And the two, these two items seem to indicate that we probably need to be a bit stronger in the way we monitor activity. Um, thank you. John? Um, I'm not sure how to, how to answer that. Yes, we we will be monitoring uh, uh, the efficacy of, of the 500K uh, and, and our, our investments for growth grants uh, within the, the growth coaching area of, of, the, uh, of the business growth service. Um, I, I think uh, the, the other issue in, in regard to uh, uh, the two errors that have led to, I think it's, I think it's slightly less than a thousand jobs, um, the, the arithmetic uh, error, I think, was only 300 jobs as, as, as a reduction. Um, and the, uh, the error that, was, uh, that led to the loss, well, it, that, that led to us deciding to go ahead without the ERDF 1.9 million uh, grant um, uh, was actually a technical error on a software package on a procurement portal that, that wasn't even ours. Uh, it, it was basically very, very boringly when the, the, as the provider submitted their proposal at midday on a particular day, um, 
they couldn't get a submit button to show. And the reason was they hadn't attached a non-mandatory um, appendix. They didn't have to attach, but there was, a, there was an error in the procurement portal software where because it didn't attach this thing, the submit button didn't appear. Uh, we corrected it in 20 minutes and MHCLG agree with us that, that we handled it perfectly, properly and fairly. But what they're worried about is their audit non-compliance rates. Uh, they're worried that when the European Commission audit them in a few years time, this will show up as a potential non-compliance and they don't want non-compliances. So they've said, re, -re procure Yeah, I, 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 I know what's the old phrase, stuff happens. And uh, <laughs> I, I do appreciate that. Yeah. And, uh, but the problem is there's two here and it creates an impression and therefore, if we're seeking, to, and that's why I linked it to the first issue, if we're linking it to raising grant funding to other bodies, we need to be, it seen to be demonstrating competence, I think, and making sure that we have the, the monitoring in place. And I know it's unfair, but nonetheless, I think what I'm saying yeah. is we seem to be, uh, what's, what's that, purer than snow? Yes, in indeed. So, so we, uh, myself, Alan will work with Rochelle uh, in, in governance to, to look at uh, uh, um, tabulating and, and recording exactly what the processes are that we went through to, uh, to recommend this, this higher grant uh, uh, value of 500K and, and how we would monitor it going forward as well in terms of its efficacy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I don't have anybody else uh, requiring to speak. So we are asked to note the uh, recommendations here uh, from the business board. Uh, can I have a, do I need a mo move and a seconder? Well, be honest. Ne not necessarily, Chair, because it's just noting. So if there's no objections, that's fine. Okay. Any objections not to note? No. We'll move on then, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll go to 2.3 now. Is, Tamar, are you back on or Rochelle, are you going to do it? I'll just continue, Chair, just for simplicity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've got three questions, yeah? Question 3A. Okay, um, page 61. There is some concern in the OSB that the CPCA is concentrating mainly on COVID recovery and is not as well cited on the current impact of Brexit on the local economy. To what extent do the authority feel that they have adequate and sufficient details of this to mitigate the effects? Okay, the response is a long one, so if you want to make a cup of tea. Okay, the economic and business impact measured in the economic research that has informed the LERS are <laughs> are a result of the combined effects of CODIF and the trade deal. However, ongoing work is has disaggregated uh, uh, the impacts of these to two factors on business for recomposing the effects. Having analysed the marketing plan, which uh, the Chamber of Commerce have enacted to raise awareness and support for the scheme, ensure that the business leaders are aware of the support on offer to them, from the 11th of January 21, the headline from the marketing campaign to all members and non-members has been six newsletters, 29 Twitter campaigns, six LinkedIn campaigns, six Facebook campaigns, six external newsletters targeted at Pacific local authorities and two website articles. To date, the campaign has added an additional 237 new businesses to the Growth Hub database for retargeting in the future. Support measures are uh, available to business leaders free of charge through our contact with the Chamber of Commerce include sector specific guidance on importing and exporting goods to, the, to and from the EU, uh, sessions on how to help employers understand and settle status uh, scheme of what it means to their staff, supporting employees to become licensed sponsors, one of the one-to-one -one meetings with advisors to go through specific questions, e.g. do I need a visa to work, a permit to travel in the EU, and e, e 
out, outbound calls with the SME leaders to encourage them to check what they have changed. Uh, and I think that uh, gets me to the end of that. Uh, so we're going now to question 3B, I think. Yeah. Appendix 1, item 6, page 95, expand on the comments relating to Peterborough University and doubt about delivery online. Was the USP of the university the level of workplace homework, home work, home, homeworking and online delivery of courses. Okay, the, the curriculum will be delivered on a blended model of the campus teaching and remote online learning with 60% off campus uh, teaching provision. Many HE institutes have successfully overcome the challenges of online teaching and it's now acceptable mode of delivery, including lab-based delivery where necessary. Blended learning allows an agile learning whilst the economic benefits in terms of lower operational and capital expenditure for the institutions are driving this model of delivery against universities. So 3C please. Page 113 to 114, item 9. Please expand on how the CA Skills Committee intends to address perceived disconnect between schools and employers in employment opportunities. Is it just that employers and teachers are not engaging with each other in a productive way, or is there a fundamental problem with the curriculum that creates the disconnect? OK, engagement between schools and the employees could always be improved, both in quantity and quality. To help facilitate this, the CPCA provides schools with current relevant labour market information, LMI. Uh, last week, we launched a new LMI portal with two sections, leading, uh, uh, leaders and learners. The, import of the portal will improve the data available to all schools and college leaders to help them inform curriculum designs and support young people and learners with their career choices. In addition to the data-driven approach, we will also be encouraging greater connectivity between schools and colleges with local businesses to offer to often the education, I think it should be offer, to offer the educational provision to as learners lead rather than business lead through the skill service. Within the recent launch business growth service, we will facilitate meaningful conversations between employers and the schools about future skills needs and talent pipelines, as well as encouraging businesses to engage with schools directly to inform their wider curriculum and career strategies uh, associated with the action plans. Could I please ask uh, John T, please, to introduce the report? Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, this March version of our local economic recovery strategy from uh, the COVID pandemic has benefited much uh, from much more data from Metro Dynamics uh, on the impacts of COVID onto our economy, and also in-depth feedback from uh, a number of sources, uh, our, our partners and colleagues in the local authorities, and particularly their economic development officers, um, detailed workshops and discussions with the FSB, the Chambers of Commerce, the CBI, and of course local organisations like Opportunity Peterborough and Cambridge Ahead. Uh, the Business Board ran a, a workshop that included the Employer Skills Board as well. Uh, and on top of that, we did a check back against other uh, LEP uh, recovery strategies, particularly the LEPs in the Opticam Arc, to make sure that, that we weren't missing a trick or missing uh, uh, an intervention that others had thought of uh, that, that we hadn't. So what we've heard uh, is that the, the second wave has unfortunately increased uh, inequalities uh, um, and increased the, uh, the need for levelling up across our economies. Uh, the, the areas that, that, are, that were doing better before COVID were hit uh, uh, less and the areas that were doing worse before COVID were hit more. Uh, so, uh, so that has uh, that, that that's caused uh, uh, a focus on those on those uh, uh, on those areas that, that really have been hit hardest, and and we're already uh, earmarked for uh, levelling up uh, support. Um, however, on a on a more positive side, um, there is increased opportunity to bake in the behavioural shifts 
uh, and the shifts in, in markets and government policy uh, that will enable us to have a greener recovery uh, and invest more in net zero technologies uh, and help companies move towards net zero more, uh, including us uh, building a, a, a supply chain in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough to service the whole of the greater southeast of, of England uh, to, to retrofit um, uh, 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 energy saving devices such as insulation, solar panels, PV, and, heat, and ground heat source pumps uh, across the greater southeast. And of course, part of that is, uh, is in the, uh, uh, the recovery strategy to have a green skill center in, in Peterborough. And, and we're looking right now at, at the new government funding to add to uh, the town's fund two million pounds uh, for that. Uh, uh, potentially another three million pounds from uh, the new uh, Communities Renewal Fund as well. Uh, so with that, uh, and to go into it with a little bit more uh, technical finesse than, than, than I'm probably capable, I'll hand you over to Mike Spicer and, and Patrick White. Uh, Mike? I think, I think Patrick's going to go first, Councillor Holditch, if that's, uh, that's okay. okay. Um, have, you, have you drawn locked up? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I got the short straw, or maybe you got the short straw in having to listen to me this morning. I'll keep this, I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep this really brief because um, I'm very conscious of time and the other things on your agenda. I won't repeat what John says about the uh, very high degree of collaboration that's gone on to gone into developing the kind of latest version of your recovery strategy, but I'll just kind of re-emphasise uh, that and how much sort of joint work has gone into this. I think there's a couple of things to, to emphasize in terms of impact and then just to get very quickly to kind of so what and, and, and what's in the strategy. I, I think it really is important to emphasize the fact that this third, this, this, this wave of COVID that occurred over the winter had a bigger impact on almost all parts of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough than the previous ones did. So, so both in terms of actual infection rates, you know, more, more, more people got ill, um, but, all the, but then the impact of the January lockdown um, has, you know, was, was more severe on, on, on your, you know, the different bits of your patch than, than, than the sort of previous uh, lockdowns in, in, in 2020. And one of the things that that has uh, meant is that this kind of attritional impact on local businesses has kind of continued to get worse. People were doing OK. Um, and then January hit. And, you know, that's been another kind of source of uh, source of kind of um, problems for, you know, revenue and, 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 and business and liquidity and so on. So, so businesses are really starting to feel this uh, on your patch now, particularly those in the, you know, in, in the sectors most affected. And we see that in the number of businesses reporting, uh, you know, reduced uh, cash flow uh, and, and so on. Um, that said, um, the impacts on um, unemployment um, have been softened by the ongoing extensions to the employment support schemes, the, the, the furlough schemes, and there was a, 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 another spike in the number of people on furlough, as you'd expect, um, in, in, in January. Um, but the schemes are in place to kind of prevent that tipping into uh, a very significant increase in unemployment. Although, um, as John referred to, unemployment has continued to kind of creep up and that has been felt most by young people and most by women and people who are more represented in the sectors which have been hardest hit. So in, in, in retail and in leisure uh, and hospitality um, and, and, and so on. One of the things that we've kind of changed in this uh, in this kind of this this latest update is the, the the time scales. So so when you last looked at this in November, you didn't know about the kind of December January kind of spike and the restrictions that we've put in place to deal with it. Um, that has pushed the kind of reopening and the kind of phase back. Lots of businesses are still in kind of survival mode uh, and will be for a while and a huge amount of additional support has gone into helping businesses with that. So what your what your kind of recovery strategy does now is to acknowledge that this kind of support um, and response phase has had to carry on for all local authorities uh, on the patch and that that will continue right through the kind of gradual reopening phase into the summer. And then a kind of um, uh, a, a kind of rebound uh, and reopening phase 
uh, then kind of begins with with a sort of renew and future growth kind of phase as we get into 23, uh, sorry, to, to 2023 uh, and, and 2024. And, and what we've done is to um, put kind of specific objectives against each of those kind of phases of, of, of recovery um, in conversation with, with local authorities uh, and other partners, and then to uh, be clear which interventions uh, kind of fit which uh, each of those kind of different, different phases. I think it's probably worth uh, saying that the other thing that's different about this draft is we've been much clearer about the impact and the different impact on your the, the different parts of the patch and that actually um, the reason that's important is because for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough to play the role that it needs to and that it should do and can do in the kind of recovery of the whole UK all three parts of your region need to kind of be be you know be be firing uh, and, and 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 to have recovered so so uh, you know consistent with all your kind of uh, strategy uh, thinking and your your kind of interventions. Um, we have to be absolutely confident that the projects and the actions we're taking are right for the different parts of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, and that they're targeting both the opportunities and the needs that those different parts have, and that they're different but very strongly interconnected. Um, we've set out um, there's a there's a there's a there's a kind of diagram that sets out how the strategy works on a single page, um, which I hope is useful. Um, we will continue to update the data as we go into kind of March, so that the purpose of this discussion is to seek your kind of approval for this strategy to go forward for for, for kind of consideration at the CA board. When we get to a public version, you know, a sort of final version, we'll obviously make sure that the data is as up to date as possible. And there's a bit of a challenge here in just kind of, you know, writing a recovery strategy for something that's still going on, because clearly at the end of March, you know, there will be there will be new data available. We don't think it's going to change the picture dramatically, but we'll make sure it continues to be kind of updated. Second major change we've done, and I'm not going to kind of um, go through each of the interventions in detail because there's a lot of them, um, as you'd expect. Um, the second big change we, we've made is to just separate the projects out into um, kind of things which are funded already and which are happening now. And some of those are local authority led, some of them are combined authority led, um, some of them are delivery of central government schemes, but things which are happening and funded now, and then things which are longer term, which are more connected with longer term uh, renewal, but for which you will need to seek future funding. And, and you've talked a little bit already today about uh, you know, th th those future funding bids, but there will be opportunities through the Leveling Up Fund and through the Community Fund and then through Shared Prosperity Fund. So there's a kind of longer term project list here, which begins to set out the emerging priorities that um, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough partners have got for that, for that longer term uh, funding. And clearly there'll be sort of, you know, business case development work done on those projects over the course of the kind of coming weeks and months, you know, as as this strategy itself is 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 finalised. There's a big emphasis on skills and retraining, as you've already touched on, and on linking skills and retraining interventions and investments to emerging opportunities and emerging emerging kind of sectors, um, as well as ensuring that people can get access to kind of retraining in ways that suit them and suit their own kind of circumstances. And there's a, you, you know, you, you'll note that there are a significant number of projects in here which are about tackling the labour market and the skills and employment elements of this. And I think they're, 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 they're absolutely right. I think that for what it's worth, just a word on, on, on Brexit, it's still very, very difficult to, well, early to untangle the precise Brexit implications beyond trade so we saw national trade figures at the end of January I think that's a that's a that's a trough if you see what I mean I think it will sort of um, steady a bit but there clearly are some very significant short-term trade impacts we don't yet have credible figures for those at a uh, kind of local level and um, we will get those in the kind of weeks and months ahead um, it's impossible to separate out any employment impacts of Brexit at the moment um, because of the furlough scheme and because of the wider impact of COVID. You just, just, you just can't do it. Um, so um, my advice, if you like, is that the approach you're taking, which is to continue to focus on the skills and employment 
uh, opportunities and challenges that you've got are, are the right ones. You know, the, the, the future industries are the future industries, whether it's whether it's COVID or Brexit. So, so actually investing in these kind of short and longer term retraining and skills uh, projects feels like feels like the right thing to do. Uh, and we will just need to keep an eye on the Brexit impacts as they become easier to kind of disentangle uh, in, in the weeks ahead. So I, I, I will leave it there, Chair. Um, back back to you. Um, we're happy to take any questions, uh, obviously, that uh, members may have. You need a gla glass of water after that, Bob. <laughs> Councillor Avery. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, yes, it's, a, it's a, a long report. And I have actually printed this off because I just like to keep referring to it, which is sad I think but nevertheless it's it's a very very important document and uh, and I and I'm pleased that we have the update I would like uh, just to as I would refer you to uh, item number nine which is on the uh, actions we are now taking and which is replicated on the on the uh, chart which has got the money of 125 million and this is about investment into into schools and I've read all of the the, the wish list that you've got down here about what you're going to do and so on and so what I would like to know and I, but before I ask that question I would just like to say a, a real thank you to Pominda and John T Hill for uh, working with me on East Cairns and what that looks like and and so on that's been incredibly helpful to get to, to get a picture so so and I, I'm looking forward to that con to continuing um, but its impact and I know things change but but when will we know what will we know about the impact of uh, whether this is working because it's nice to have this money up front but the monitoring of this and the changes that occur because of this are absolutely vital in the short and medium term and I'm just wondering how you're going to monitor the fact that the 125 million which you put aside for for uh, working in schools, you will know what that impact is in each of the districts. And I know that each of my councillor colleagues will be particularly interested in, in, in their own districts. But also to say that we have an opportunities area in East Cams and, and Fenland, and it is in fact they who paid for the upskilling of the careers advisors in schools. So that kind of synergy working with other people who have got funds and targets for our two areas is, is really, really important. I'd like to be reassured that that is, is, is happening as well. Thank you. Okay, John T, I'll bring you in a minute if you can uh, make a note of the questions and you can pick them up at yeah. the end. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Um, I, I've got a couple of drafting comments and I've got a, another question. So if I do the drafting comments first, perhaps... Um, on page 76 at the bottom of the page, there's a reference to CJRS and SEISS with no explanation of what they are. I think the explanation does come later on in the document, but it'd be useful to have it there. Um, um, page 95, the, the table, um, line six in the comments, um, there's a bit of... Um, there seems to be something missing from the drafting there. It doesn't make sense. And um, so that's that. Um, yeah, uh, um, as a general thing, I, I feel like, yeah, I, I know that will come in time, but it feels like that we've got two things going on here. We've got the, the COVID-19 and we have got Brexit and it would be useful as we go forward to actually have a bit more um analysis on the impact of Brexit and I understand that you can't do it at this moment. Um, on page um, 108 to 109 um, there's a paragraph about new inward investment the new inward investment service and that refers to 1,200 jobs and I was wondering whether in light of the um, the earlier discussion that should not be referring to the 600 because of the loss, the potential loss of the EU funding. Okay, John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll just do those those two last ones uh, first. Why <laughs> they're still fresh in my mind? Um, the uh, so we will uh, we will be trying to disaggregate, which isn't easy. Uh, the economic impacts of COVID 
and the economic impacts of the trade deal. Uh, and uh, we, we're working with uh, that sort of dynamics, I wouldn't say permanently, but continuously uh, now, whereby they'll, they'll be giving us monthly updates on econometric data. We've got the chambers that are giving uh, trade deal support advice, but they're also now, because of uh, uh, overview, and, overview and scrutiny committee's uh, intervention, they're also being asked to record sentiment and issues with, uh, with the trade deal or, or with companies uh, managing the effects of the trade deal. So uh, the next uh, report we have, which will probably be something like June, uh, because we will do another iteration of our recovery uh, uh, report, it, it will attempt to disaggregate the impacts of COVID and the impacts of the, of the new trade deal uh, uh, on there. That's number one. Number two, yes, you are absolutely right. The report should be amended uh, to show the smaller, uh, well, roughly half, half uh, <clears throat> the number of inward investment jobs uh, that will be created because we, we have uh, uh, reduced that, uh, that funding uh, because of the ERDF funding. Uh, so, yeah, we haven't, uh, because both decision-making processes were going on in parallel, we haven't uh, correlated the two, but we, but we will do. Um, the, uh, is that satisfactory before I go on to the previous questions? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Councillor Avery, the, the, the answers to, to your questions are very, 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 very sensible in that, great, we've got a strategy, but how do we know whether it's working? Uh, and, and how do we monitor that? Um, so uh, the answer to that one is, is twofold, and it's, it, it's massively uh, more uh, uh, more detailed now that, than uh, than a couple of years ago. We 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 didn't really have uh, that detailed uh, an ability to monitor the the impacts of our intervention until recently. But the two changes that we've made that really do give us the ability monthly and quarterly to impact to, to monitor the min the impact of our interventions and our strategy are twofold. Number one mentioned before, we've now got a continuous relationship with, with Metro Dynamics, whereby they are keeping tabs on what's happening in the economy across different sectors and different types of business. So we can see the ultimate impact of what's going on. That doesn't, of course, tell us, did we do that? It, it just shows us what's happening. We, we can't see that we did it. Uh, so the second thing we've done is we've moved into a, a, a contractual relationship through the growth service, whereby um, the, the job numbers and skills outcomes that are in the FBC and are, uh, and are in the, uh, uh, the local economic recovery strategy, they've now been made contractual outcomes of our growth service. So, so the providers have to report on them monthly and quarterly uh, so that we can see what impact that they actually are having against the, 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 the number of job impacts and skills impacts that, that we told councillors uh, and leaders we would be achieving in our strategy and, and, and in our FBC. So we will be monitoring and the amount of money they end up getting paid does change if they do not deliver against the contract we've given them. So we, 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 we've got two quite detailed methods now. We will measure the economic impacts and we will measure the specific impacts our interventions are having. And hopefully we'll see a correlation between the two. That's really assuring, John. Thank you very much. When will we have sight of that in the Skills Committee? When will we be able to back end the front end of the, of the, of the strategy, recovery strategy? Yeah. Uh, Every second meeting, I, I, I do notice if you look in uh, uh, attendees, the chair of the growth company is observing today, Nigel oh, Parkinson. Hi. <laughs> uh, hello, hello, Mr. Parkinson. Nigel will be Nigel will be in front of you every second meeting to account for the performance of the growth company and right. the, the business growth service against the contractual targets that that we set them, which were in the FBC. So, uh, yeah, every second meeting, you will get a chance to scrutinise and hold us to account. That's great. Thank you very much, John. Very helpful. Thank you. If we haven't frightened him off. 
<laughs> yeah, we might have done. <laughs> All right, Councillor Davy. Really very simple one, just to say thank you. Um, the, 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 I think it's sometimes uh, not very clear when you're sitting in these committees that we might appear critical. This has been a really important piece of work and has come through within, certainly within the city, and just to express gratitude to you and your team for the work you've done and the impact that's having upon our work back in Cambridge. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I have nobody else uh, indicating they wish to speak. Uh, so we're asked to note it. Do I have a, uh, a proposal for that, please? Uh, Councillor Davy, seconder. Councillor Leash. Okay. Anybody against accepting that? Can you please show? No, I see no objections. So the recommendation is carried. Okay. Uh, so I'm now going to. Uh, uh, three one, uh, and we I'm going to ask Parman, Parmanda to introduce the report, please. Busy day for you, Parmanda. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. So the second paper from me introduces the independent evaluation that was undertaken of the first year of devolution, the 2019-20 academic year of the adult education budget, and un under our evaluation framework were required to evaluate and assess the impact of, of the programmes. And the independent evaluation has been included for you to read. Um, and the headlines that I'd like to draw your attention to from the evaluation are, firstly, we, took, we successfully took the AEB budget from the Education and Skills Funding Agency. And ultimately we improved the efficiency and efficacy of the funding and how it's deployed within our region. So firstly, focusing on reducing the administrative burden, reduced 190 providers to a core of 17 local providers. And we reduced reduce subcontracting from 41% to 17%. Secondly, we targeted the funding to areas of economic and educational deprivation within the region, particularly in the North, but also pockets throughout wider Cambridgeshire. So prior to devolution, 22% of um, enrolments um, were, were in these areas. We increased that to 34%. And thirdly, we've improved the mix and balance of provision. And that is the balance between adult skills qualifications and community learning and increasing the proportion of level two and level three qualifications that we deliver that are going to enable our residents to be more um, resilient within the labour market. The evaluation also notes the impact of COVID-19 um, on delivery and also captures the views of providers, which were mainly positive. So essentially the evaluation shows that we've started the journey in terms of reforming our AEB investment um, to ensure it, it better serves our region. We intend to publish the evaluation report as part of our transparency regime. Um, and we're also working on the specification for our year two evaluation. And we want to improve the richness of the analysis and looking at thematic deep dives into learner characteristics and also looking at uh, geographic and district level analysis. Um, and this will help us to um, open up further discussions about local need and impact. And so in future years, we'll be able to re refine the annual evaluation to really tell the story and showcase the benefits of devolution and the transformation that's been taking place in communities across the region. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> Members. He must have done a good job. Oh no, Councillor Wilson. This this is just uh, it's it's uh, the, the, the um it's all I, I'm very pleased about all of this work and I think it's really important and it's going to become even more important as um 
as there's a shift in in occupations and i'm i'm just wondering um my, my son works for john lewis and they they they've been going through a redundancy program at the moment but they they're, they're actually putting money into retraining for the staff who are likely to be made redundant and i wonder how much um you're working with companies who are doing that so that you can actually help we can be mutually supportive for coming from the employer and and the um adult education um program to help these people who are having to reskill really Arminda? absolutely uh, in terms of the conversations with with our providers it really has been getting them to to um use the flexibilities that we're giving them to focus on, on responses to redundancies. And um, you will have seen the actions, the action log from the previous um, meeting about Debenhams um, and certainly AV um, funding, funded providers have been involved um, in working with Opportunity Peterborough to do that as an example um, of this. Um, and we'll continue to um, broker those conversations um, with our AV funded providers with any response to redundancy activity that takes place within the region. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Davey. Uh, yeah, again, uh, like Councillor Wilson, welcome the report. The, it's a, the question I've got is actually about the uh, table two, I think it's on one, one page 146, and it demonstrates the shift away from uh, community learning and I suppose it was just to ask a question did the evaluators pick up anything any kickback from that at all because I know there was concerns and has been concerns in the past about how the impact would be felt by people who are used to community learning so it's really a question about what's not there if that makes sense Parminda. So this was an, an, an independent evaluation and and so we haven't um, apart from setting the specification for it in terms of the findings, they are as they are written. We have we haven't interfered or tinkered with them in any in any in any way, and and that's why it's so valuable, I think. But in terms of the wider point that you're making around community learning, um, just to 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 um, add is that we are doing some work um, in terms of our future policy around community learning, um, especially um, given as we as we come out of the pandemic as we come into recovery is that we, we value um, and recognize the importance of community learning, um, especially in terms of um, providing the first rung uh, for many of our communities. And it's about um, how, do we, how do we revitalize the offer? So we are actually planning, um, and we'll, we'll bring up, um, some information to a future meeting around setting up a group that's looking at, at um, as we come out of, um, as we come out of, the, as we come out of lockdown and into a uh, recession. How do we, we, we really revitalize the community learning offer? How do we look at, um, at, at making it more targeted? How do we look at the, um, the pound plus element of it in terms of the, 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 full, the full paid for aspect of it? Because we want to have a, a rich and um, wide offer that looks at the wider impact of learning Yes, the skills aspect is, is absolutely important, but in terms of um, the wider outcomes around community engagement, health and well-being, um, all of those things are important too. So it's about ensuring, as I said earlier, the mix and balance of provision is right for us and that we have the right flexibilities in place and that ultimately we're co-producing it with our partners. So it's very much um, a joint um, policy and a joint approach um, working together in order to, to, to get the, the provision to meet local needs. So that, that's sort of the direction of travel, if that helps. Um, and in terms <laughs> of, uh, so, sorry, to, just to add, in terms of the second year evaluation, um, I mentioned the deep dives. So there will be um, a deeper dive in terms of looking at community learning and looking at the impact as well um, in our second year um, evaluation. Thank you very much. Very helpful. I mean, perhaps important stress, I do welcome the shift towards adult skill rather than community learning. But I will also welcome what you said, Parminder, about bringing back so we can look at how we revitalise community learning in the future. So thank you, Parminder. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can I have a uh, 
propose a please to accept a, a, a noting of these uh, two uh, recommendations? Can I have a proposal, please? Happy to, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Every Seconder? I can second. Thank you, uh, Councillor Wilson. Uh, do I have anybody, any objections? No? You have been very good today to me. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going now, to, I think it's Parminda again, isn't it? It is. Um, yeah. And um, this third and final paper from me aims to report and highlight some of the ongoing challenges that have been faced by our adult education providers <coughs> due to the lockdowns. And members will note the 23% reduction in enrolments um, to date. Um, but just also to add that all of our providers have continued to deliver and enrol learners through online delivery. So the paper sets out some of the mitigations uh, that we put in place. The first one is around uh, very close partnership working with our providers and close performance monitoring of our existing providers through our quarterly performance review meetings and looking at how we can support them with flexibilities, um, particularly um, in, in redundancy response, um, as we've, we've, we've heard already in this meeting, um, and also supporting digital inclusion. So we have invested funding through our learner support funds into the purchase of laptops, devices, dongles uh, to support learners who don't have access so that they can continue with their learning. The, the earlier paper from me talked about our commissioning guiding principles, and we are looking to commission some new providers, um, particularly as the, the under delivery results in an underspend and subject to combined authority board approval um, of underspend, we'll be looking at um, commissioning uh, provision, particularly where we have cold spots in provision or where we want to um, support um, activities such as sector-based work academies, response to redundancy, uh, more level two and level three provision. And finally, to highlight the, um, the communication and marketing team collaborative work we've been doing to promote the learning offer through the new CPCA website and various press releases and social media promotion, which I hope um, members um, have had sight of and also to provide an update on the innovation fund projects, which are supporting digital inclusion and response to redundancy, but also small scale capital upgrades. And, and again, I hope that members have seen some of the good news stories in the local papers about the innovation fund projects. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, members. Do, do we share those good news stories with members? Because members uh, do like to see the results of the good work that they do. They get plenty of publicity on the ones that we don't, but uh, an idea of the press releases we'll put out the good stories and send, them, and send to members. Absolutely, we'll, we'll take that as an action, um, uh, Chairman, to take <laughs> members of sight of those stories. Right. I do not have anybody that wishes to speak. Uh, I just need to get some advice here because I've got two uh, recommendations to note and one to approve. So do I need to, uh, obviously need a, a seconder and so but do we need a vote on it, please, Rochelle? Yes, please, Chair. Thank you. Okay, fine. So we, we'll move to uh, a thing. So we're noting uh, uh, recommendation A, approving recommendation B, and noting uh, C. So can I have a proposal, please? Councillor Nish, thank you. Seconder. Councillor Ambrose Smith, thank you very much. Uh, so, those in, are oh, we going to call, you want to call in Rochelle, do you? Whatever's easy for you, Chairman. I'm happy for you just to get objections. I've hands waved in, in the chat. Okay. okay. <clears throat> do I have any objections to that? No. All clear, I think. Thank you very much. We're going now. Go to three, four, budget. Vanessa, I think. Vanessa? Three, three. 
0.3 chair employment and skills board update. Uh, you've missed Fliss, it's not me, sorry. It's on the next one. All right, Chris, so you said. Okay, thank you. Good morning to you, Chair and committee members. This paper provides an overview of the discussion and presentations received at the most recent Employment and Skills Board held on the 19th of January earlier this year. So key points to note, I think, um, for you is that the meeting was split into two sections. The first was followed a traditional agenda styled meeting um, and the second was in a workshop. So in the first half of the meeting, um, we received a number of presentations and probably um, the key presentation to note was that from Metro Dynamics, which was on the skills deep dive report, which is a piece of work that was commissioned um, back in um, the summer last year. That report um, focuses on the skills that are in demand across the combined authority area in the four growth and priority sectors. Um, it also looks at the occup occupational crossover between those priority sectors jobs most at, um, at risk of automation and also the supply of skills um, across those priority um, areas too. If the, if the Skills Committee hasn't received that skills deep dive report, it has just been finalised and I'll make sure that that's sent out um, following the meeting. Uh, in the second half of this section uh, of the of the meeting, um, we went into a workshop style, and this was based on the context of the um, requirement for a local skills report, um, which is a requirement by the DFE for the skills advisory panel. One section of that report um, focuses on the assessment of progress. Um, and so the uh, Employment and Skills Board took a very honest reflection of how well the board is performing. Um, and it was well received and as a result of the workshop we do have a clear direction and a refocus um, prioritization of how the board will focus going forward. Um, it was noted that a number of um, areas of progress had been made and there'd been significant impact but also if we were to refocus um, the board's attention going forward we could also achieve more. Thank you. Thank you Any questions? Okay, we've got no questions, so well done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're doing, uh, I need a, uh, a proposer, please, to note the Employment and Skills Board update. Proposer, please. Councillor Ambrose Smith, seconder, please. Councillor David, thank you very much. So I think uh, I can uh, ask you, anybody object? No, you can come again. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Can I now go to Vanessa, please? I've turned it over because I was going to vote on the other page. That's what happened. <laughs> okay, Vanessa. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, members. Um, normal usual report presented to the committee today. This is a uh, monthly update on the finances. The overview is, is much closer to the year end position where we are now and will be much more um, reflected on the, the current position of the finances as we stand. The headlines really to, to show are that the main areas of underspend are reflected within the AEB project lines, as you will note, across the main programme and some of the other areas that Tom Minder has already addressed some of these within the papers that he's in, he's presented to the board. There are further details presented in my report. The biggest area that we have a major underspend is the Health and Care Sector Work Academy, which many of you are aware of. Um, we understand this is approach, they have approached the Department for Work and Pensions to reprofile the project yet again. Um, <clears throat> we are awaiting the outcome of that, so I'm in, unable to give you completely accurate figures on that. Again, they have been extremely hit by the impacts of COVID-19, which is which has um, necessitated the extension of this program. However, as this is ring-fenced funding, this is not uh, money that will be going elsewhere and it will be retained within the project, provided it's, it's within the constraints of the DWP um, actions. There are a number of minor small overspends within the skills uh, budgets and a couple of minor underspends. A lot of this is related to the delay in the 
start of the business growth service program because obviously the figures were originally budgeted until the beginning of october um, we're doing our best to monitor these and to, to maintain these and to offset them within the budgets where possible we have raised odns and um to explain these extra increases in spend. So if, if not possible, there is, a, there is a good reason within the authority why we have gone over budgets on this. The, hopefully that's explained most of the questions. The income is, is showing is, is, is very healthy. The new section of the report that we've added in, again, this is, all of this is due to the additional funding that we are now receiving from um, the DfE for the adult education budget. And finally, the only capital project that we have under the um, auspices of the Skills Committee is the University of Peter for Phase 1, which is showing the funding fully committed and out and ready for as, as the project has fully begun. So hopefully I've, I've explained enough for you all, but if you do have any questions, please feel free. I like you because you never turn around and say you haven't got any money, you can't do it. I try not to, but it, it does happen occasionally, as John will warrant. <laughs> you are very lucky. You keep getting extra money. So, <laughs> I counsel David. Yeah, I just I, again, I, it's an odd one. This, bearing in mind the size of the health and social care academy, I just wonder if we should have a separate report somewhere um, identifying why, just in terms of the probity of this committee, rather than actually outlining any particular issues. But it just, it would seem to make sense for us to have a look at this at some stage in more depth. Also, there is an independent report done by the uh, Works and Pensions by oh, some Sir, somebody or other, I think, uh, and uh, which is recommending that. So, I mean, there's no reason I don't think that that report shouldn't be shared as well, is there? It, it's uh, something that I'll pick up offline because it's uh, it's an, a project that it, that comes under Fliss's um, auspices, and um, obviously we'll speak to John Hill and how we work that through, and we'll, we'll bring something together. Now, whether we set we send that separately to the committee members or we put it in the paper. Um, we will we'll have that discussion. I'm grateful, Vanessa. Thank you. Okay. Anybody, other members? It must be getting near dinner time or something. Uh, <laughs> can I have a proposal, please, to note the update on the, on the financial position? Okay. Councillor Ambrose Smith and seconder. Councillor David. Well done. Thank you very much. Anybody against that? No? Okay, I think apart from the date of the next meeting, which is the 12th, uh, 14th of June, uh, I'd just like to say, if you probably all know by now, I'm retiring from the council after 44 years, I think it is. Uh, and I'd just like to thank uh, you members uh, for your support of me and uh, the clarity in which you go into, and also to all the officers that have supported. We've got a really good officer team now, uh, and I uh, I think uh, I, I leave it in very good hands, if that isn't uh, uh, too... Uh, so congratulate you. So thank you, thank you all. Uh, don't say I'll see you in other roles somewhere. Uh, so I think that concludes today's meeting, Michelle. Does it? Thank you, Chairman. Always a pleasure. Oh, very noted. Enjoy your <laughs> retirement. I'll yes, try. do enjoy your retirement, John. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you very much. thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Members. Well done, John. Yes.